All right, welcome to CIS 137 class five. Let's quote today, the secret to building large apps is never build large apps. Break your applications into small pieces, then assemble those testable bite-sized pieces into your big application. And that is by uh, Justin Meyer and he wrote JavaScript and VC, which came out before React existed, and they actually, uh, he has a framework called Done.js, D-O-N-E, that seems interesting. I wanted to check it out at some point. I haven't really looked into it much, but uh, the philosophy he has here with breaking your application into small pieces, that's definitely what React does with the components. So it's very appropriate for React. Today, we're going to do two sections on components. We're going to do components with state and uh, the life cycle of components. We're also going to talk about routing in React. And routing means being able to go to different pages. So stateful components. So first, you should uh, read this section in the React tutorial, in the React docs. It talks about state and life cycle, but we're actually going to be uh, using this example today in class for the state and the life cycle methods. So we'll be covering that. So what is state? State is uh, a special field in inside your component that allows you to remember past interactions and any other data that's useful for that component and uh, anything that really affects how that component is displayed to the screen. So I'll explain that in a second. But uh, you have basically two uh, fields that come in for uh, each component, you have props and state. Props come from the outside, they come from the parent, so props are passed in through the JSX attributes, while state uh, is only known to that, uh, the component that it's in. State is not passed, or state is not necessarily brought in from anywhere or you know, passed on, but it could be, but it'd be through props. So state data is internal, and is not directly accessible by outside components. Uh, state also has a special property where whenever the state is changed, it will update, it'll uh, update the UI. So it will call render function again whenever the state is changed. And I'll uh, dig into that in a minute. So in last class, we used functional components, which were just uh, functions that took a props uh, argument. With state, we need to use the class components. And technically, uh, there's another kind of functional component that you can use that has state. Uh, and there's also uh, you know, React has a built-in create component piece but ES6 classes are the new way to do it, and they're, uh, they have a lot of advantages. So let's start off with showing how you would go from a stateless, stateless functional component to a class component. So let's say you have an app. You, know, you create a bunch of stateless functional components to keep it clean uh, and easy. Now you want to upgrade that to have classes instead, so you can have state. So this will be the first of that section. So I'm going to go ahead and fork this so I can make changes. All right, so this is directly from the state and life cycle. Uh, document here. It's pretty much this second option here. 
So we're going to change this function clock into a ES6 class. First thing we're going to do is we're just going to name this clock two. So uh, we can reference it, but uh, it's not going to get in the way of rendering. So we want to change this to a class. Uh, we start with the class keyword, then we put a name. And then for all the components, it needs to have this exact phrase at the end. It needs extends react.component. This, this could be just component here, and I'll show you how it could just be component when we get to imports next. But uh, react.component works. Okay, and then to emulate this, all you need is a render function. The render function would just look like that. And the contents of the render function would be the exact contents of the, uh, well, almost the exact contents of the stateless functional component. So we can just copy this over. Now, one important difference is that uh, you can't just say props in the render method because we don't have a props variable anywhere. You know, we had the props argument here, so we could use it down here. But here, we actually have to say this.props. And now, once we did that, you see the clock is working again. So we can improve its working by getting rid of that. That's how you go from the stateless functional component to a class. We're going to be adding more to this in order to uh, do state, but that's a straight conversion. Now, at the top of these code pins, they don't show the import statements. You know, it doesn't show uh, how it's ultimately put together. So let's go to WebStorm and show how these import statements work. And first, this is a good reference for those import statements at the top. It shows you all the options possible. Uh, and I'll be going through them as we go, but uh, if you ever have a question about how one is, you know, you know, this default member, comma, star as name from module name, you could look into here and see uh, a little reference on how that works, but it's mainly just for syntax purposes. So let's talk about how it actually works. So here is React uh, Starter Project. So this basically was created with just create React app starter three, and then I CD'd into starter three, opened it up in WebStorm. So it literally, it was just create React app starter three in my directory, and then I just opened the folder in WebStorm. Uh, I added this components directory that we'll talk about later. Now up here we see import react comma and then in brackets component from react. So what this is saying is uh, what this is saying is it's going to import the react uh, it's going to import all of react as a react object and it's going to import just component as well. So this is what's known as a spread operator. Um, I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but basically what it does is it lets you cherry pick fields from an object. So really, the only object in this React is uh, this outer object, this React, but then we can break it down into uh, smaller pieces as well. So instead of saying, 
you know, we could say react.component, but that's a lot of typing. So we just imported component separately, kind of like a shorthand, so we can just get it rid of the react dot from there. So in CodePen, we had to use react.component, but since we imported component with react, we can use this shorthand here, just use component. And we can actually name this whatever we wanted. We could say r, r dot component. That's that's uh you know that's not readable. What's more readable is using React. Don't even need the React dot because we imported component already. <laughs> now this is from a module. So the modules are whatever you uh, you know, React is a built-in module, but you can add more modules to your project that are basically like external projects. Uh, and they end up inside this node modules folder. And these are all the plugins and extra things that we're using uh, in our project. And uh, yeah, we'll dig more into node modules later. It's, uh, it's a topic for another day. So import logo from dot slash logo dot SVG. So this is importing directly from a file that has a relative path. So when you use dot slash, that means the current directory. And then it has the file name. And WebStorm has something neat where if you start typing something like that, then it'll autocomplete uh, the path for you. So we're importing the logo from this SVG file. So this SVG is uh, an image type uh, called Scalable Vector Graphics that looks like uh, XML when you look at it. You can actually write it out like this, and then it turns itself into an image. Uh, it's able to render in the browser from that XML. We're importing that actual image into a variable here. So we can use it in our image source later. And last, we're importing a CSS file. So we're not giving this a name. We're not saying CSS from, but we could, but it's, it's totally not necessary. All we're doing is importing this app.css file. Now the reason that's important um, has to do with how files uh, are, are packaged and included when the project actually turns into a website. So React uh, is commonly built or bundled, as they say, with, with uh, a program called Webpack. And Webpack is, happen is occurring in uh, Create React apps structure. It's just uh, hidden from you. But what it does is it looks through all the components and sees uh, if files are actually accessible or not, or actually accessed. So app.css would not get included with the bundle unless you know app.js imported it, had a reference to it. So we're not actually using it inside of here. We're just importing it so it's included in the bundle. Now we're going to import so I have, uh, app intro, which just has the app intro code directly in it. And then I have a hello world uh, stateless functional component that has other text in it. So I'm just going to show you how to import those real quick. And then we're going to use them later. I'm going to import hello world. I can name this whatever I want. I'm going to name it hello world. It's kind of like a, a variable name. From dot slash components slash hello world. The, you don't need to put the dot js at the end. But you can, but uh, to keep it look, looking neater, you don't need to put it there. It'll automatically insert it for you. So we're going to import the, the app intro as well. When we first import these, they're going to be grayed out in uh, WebStorm, and that just means that we're not using them yet. We'll use those in a second. Uh, we can replace this app intro with app intro, so you can see. And since this has no 
no children, we can just end it right there. See, now app intro is colored instead of gray. So now, uh, let's talk about actually setting the initial state. So to set the initial state, which is the original values that the state will have, we need to use the constructor in the ES6 class. So that's just a special uh, method that is named constructor, and it takes a props argument, or has a props parameter. And this is only run once when the component is instantiated. And the component is usually instantiated when it's included in JSX or uh, with the react.create class method that we're not using, we're just using JSX. So once the component uh, appears in JSX, React will uh, create it. It'll instantiate that, that component. Next, the first line of the method must be super props. So it must call a method called super, and it must pass it the props it got from the constructor's argument. So that has to do with inheritance. And uh, if you really want to know about inheritance, then take 132. But if, if uh, another thing to just do is just include the super props line at the top of your method. And uh, I'll explain more about how that inheritance works with later down the line if we have time, but for now, just know you need to put it there. Then you can set your initial state after that. And with that, you just assign an object literal with key values to this dot state. Let's see here, we have our class, it extends React component, uh, but we have no state in here. So let's say instead of passing the, the new date over, we're going to get it from, uh, we're gonna store it in the state. We're going to just create a new date into the state. We're gonna create that constructor method and pass in props. And then we're going to call super props. Next, we're going to set the state. So this dot state equals, or I guess date from the state, and pass it new date. So we're instantiating a date object. And that's the same as what's being passed to the prop. So now we're going to say, instead of using this dot props, we're going to use this dot state dot date. And we're going to get rid of this prop. So now it's showing the date time, but, but it's not updating anymore. That's because it, it was only passing the date in the props. Now it's the updated date. The state is now uh, set when the clock is first instantiated. So when it's first rendered in this JSX, this constructor is called, super props is called, this dot state equals date new date is called. So this this class got this, or this component got this new date at 8.21, 45 seconds, and then it rendered it. Now it's still being rendered every 1,000 or every one second, is 1,000 milliseconds, it's calling tick. And that tick is rendering the clock. But you see the time is not changing because that time is stored in the state. So this, this instantiator, this constructor is not being called over and over again, even though uh, tick is being called over and over again. It's just uh, being rendered over and over again. And since there are no changes, uh, nothing changes here.
So again, constructor and super props. And your constructor props, and there's some function inside the class. So you see it's at the same level as render. And you just call super props, and then you can set your state. Now it's very important to set your state as an object literal. You can't do something like state that date equals new date. And the only place you can set the state like this is in the constructor. And we're going to talk about uh, how you set the state in other places in the next uh, 20 minutes in the component lifecycle. So you have any questions? Let's see. Any questions about uh, state or ES6 classes or imports or uh, the project is due on Friday morning, by Friday morning? OK, no questions yet. Let's see, I had a question on Slack. Let's see if I can pull that up. Okay, I can't find the question, but I remember the gist of it. This the question was about uh, changing the app.js file and getting errors uh, when trying to run it and not being able to figure out why it was not working anymore. So one uh, common error when you're creating a component is uh, that this render method must return only one root HTML element. So for example, if we try to return two HTML elements, let's say we try to add a header to this. We get errors that look like this. This is basically saying we can't return you know, two root elements where you have header and then div on the same level. Div could be inside of header. It could be a child. And that would work, but it wouldn't have the exact uh, meaning that you wanted. Have the header above the app. So if you wanted to do something like this, have two root elements, you have to wrap those in a, in a parent element. So you'd have to wrap it basically a div. Divs are just basically some blank space for you. you do that, and then it's happy again. Another error might be you know, leaving off these parentheses. WebStorm will highlight this in yellow, and it says expression statement is not assignment or call. We say unreachable code. It's, uh, it's pretty messy. Especially if you, if you go like that, it looks a little bit better. Uh, I think Webpack might mess it up, but uh, ultimately the best thing to do is to surround your JSX with parentheses. This is a universal way to make sure the JavaScript or JSX is not you know, automatically semicolon at the end for strict editors. Uh, you'll see this method can be static. Just ignore that. You know. uh, eventually, it will not be static at all, because we'll be using. So static methods basically don't have access to the this keyword anymore, uh, but technically would be 
faster because uh, it would take up less space because it would be the same method across all app components. But you don't need to worry about that. that don't worry about this yellow method can be static message. See so what other errors can you get in here? Uh, import statements. You can mess these up. These are direct paths to, or relative paths to uh, the files you want, uh, or node modules. So node modules don't have the dot slash in the beginning. They are in a different folder, but they React knows how to include those uh, without the dot slash. So instead of having to do like, so dot dot slash means go up a directory. Dot, dot slash known modules slash react is what we could ultimately do, but the shorthand for that is just to say react with no no folder paths in front of it. And this is just a, a like a convenience. Since most of the things you're going to import are from uh, node modules, you know, if you don't have any folder paths at the beginning, React just adds that for you automatically. Uh, if the file doesn't exist, you know, net web, uh, WebStorm will show message up here, but when you go to run it, it might give you an error later. I have another app running right now that I need to kill. All right, well, here it comes. Now we see failed to compile, module not found, cannot resolve logo 2.svg. So that has to be. So we just change it back to logo. We save it. And I have some code in here I actually didn't want to have in here. So let's clean that out real quick anyway. Is it for the next? For the third section today, that you know, we're gonna do it a different way. All right, so now it's running, and here's our logo. Welcome to React, and to get started, edit source app.js and save to reload. So, so we uh, from the app method we use app intro from components app intro. So that's actually just to get started, edit source app.js and save to reload code. Uh, and we'll go into this a little bit uh, in the next sections. All right, so let's talk about component lifecycle. So lifecycle for a component basically handles the creation, the update, and then the destruction or deletion of the components afterwards. And React Framework does all that for you. So using a framework, uh, whether it be you know .NET or Angular or React or any other framework, uh, they generally provide a way to hook into the component lifecycle or the class lifecycle or whatever that particular framework calls pieces of code. Uh, the React framework does all this for you, and it does it in an efficient manner, uh, generally more efficient than you could write yourself. So that's why you would use a framework. It makes it very, it's all testable, it's uh, documented, and it uh, has these established hooks, these life cycle, cycle hooks. So what's the life cycle? So components are mounted or created when they are included in currently rendered JSX. So if it's if it's going to display to the page, if it's added to the virtual DOM, the component is mounted. 
that's just it. that you would call it mounted in React because that's what the terminology they use, but that's when it's created as well. Now, whenever props or state changes, the components are updated, and then you can hook into special places in there to tell when the component was actually updated. Then components are unmounted or destroyed uh, when they are no longer in currently rendered JSX. So when they're dropped from the virtual DOM, then they are taken out. And that's when you would uh, clean up the things that you set up. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, common to do things when it deletes. Uh, but it's more. I feel like it's more common to do things when it's mounted than it is when it's unmounted. Well, We'll dig into that a bit. So lifecycle function hooks. So the way you uh, can tell what part of the lifecycle a component is in when you're inside the component is by adding more methods to your component. So just like how you added the constructor props method to uh, call super props and then set the initial state when the when the component is instantiated you can add these methods to your uh, component or functions to your component that will be called when these particular lifecycle events are happening for this for that particular instance of the component so the two we're going to look at today are component did mount <clears throat> which fires after the initial render component will unmount which fires before the component is destroyed and there, there are more uh, there are more lifecycle uh, function hooks and if you go to this cheat sheet which is actually pretty uh, helpful for you know how to do stateless react components uh, shows you how to do a couple imports shows you how to do render but the lifecycle hooks so you have to use a class for local state and lifecycle hooks so you see here it has our constructor super props setting the state it's actually using the same example i used uh, then it shows all these lifecycle hooks you can use so we're going to be using component did mount you know so also component will mount uh, that could be used component will receive props which is an, uh, tells you when the component is going to be updating due to external forces with the props changing. Should component update uh, before it actually renders an update, it'll ask you, or if it'll run this function, and if this function exists, this function can return true or false. And if it uh, returns false, then the render function is not called. So you can actually control. You could check you know, if the props have changed enough or the state has changed enough before the component will update. Now, React has a built-in way of checking those changes. That works very good, but sometimes it won't work. So sometimes you would need to actually uh, implement this method, but not very often. Component will update. So right before rendering, it'll it has the new props or state. Uh, then component did update after it rendered with the new props or state. And at the end, component will unmount. So it fires immediately before the component is unmounted from DOM. So once it's removed from the virtual DOM, uh, right before that, it will unmount. And I'll show you an example that uses component did mount and component will unmount. As a hooking into the lifecycle is not uh, not super common, but it does happen a lot. So check it out. So here's the starting point for this one. I'll go ahead and fork it so I don't so you guys can start from it too. Okay, so from the last. Uh, example we did. Let me see, is that still open? Yeah. So we had this example, uh, and all I did from there was remove 
set interval and I'm just calling react dot Tom dot render directly from uh, the global level so instead of calling the tick function encapsulating this in the tick function I'm just calling react Tom dot render the clock so now it's no longer uh, calling tick at all or doing that that interval So instead of doing that interval externally, you know, instead of updating the time, we're going to update the time internally. For this one, we're going to add a component did mount function. So here, we're not going to take any. Uh, I'm not going to have any parameters. We're just going to have the component did mount function. So we indicate the function with the parentheses, and then we have the function body inside the curly braces. And inside here, we're going to set up the ticking of the clock. Is that timer ID equals set interval? See if I can remember this. Let's actually control Z so we can see how it's called. Okay, so the tick function and then 1000 milliseconds. So we actually look at the uh, function here. We could probably see this here too. So this set interval, I don't expect you to know it outright. I don't know it outright. It's, it's a special component method that lets you set timers, repeatable timers. And uh, if we look here, we can see this dot timer ID equals set interval. And then it's using a uh, arrow function to call this dot tick. Now the reason it's doing that has to do with um, the this keyword. And we'll, we'll jump into arrow functions a bit, maybe during the 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, but this is basically a, a shorthand for function declarations. I can't remember if I taught that or not already. So we might have a special section in this class. I'm going to review my notes and see where it can fit in and talk about arrow functions in this a little bit more. So we're going to set the interval and we're going to pass it a function and a time. So this is in milliseconds. So uh, it's going to call that function every uh, 1,000 milliseconds, which is one second. We use the arrow function here and call this dot tick. We don't have a tick function yet, but we're going to add it, and we're going to use uh, 1,000 milliseconds. Let's add this tick function real quick. So this will be a other instance method here will take no uh, parameters and it's going to set the state in here. Now instead of saying this dot state equals date new date, this is not uh, a good way to do it because uh, React has a special method called set state. When you set state, then React will fire off that update process. If you just use this dot state, React isn't going to know that state changed. It's not. It doesn't have watchers. There's no way to watch that variable for changes uh, in a reliable fashion. So the uh, way React does it is it uses this dot set state, and here you just pass it an object representing. Uh, whatever you wanted to update. So even if you say this uh, set state date, new date, if you had other state variables in here, you know, maybe we could put a name in here. Oops. Instead of having, or yeah, with the set state, 
you know, we could just have our our date, new date inside of here. You see, it's already working down here. It's already jumping again. Uh, but we don't need this second line. This will set the state for us. It'll it'll update only what's included inside of this object literal. So it's not going to update the name. And I can prove it. We can put the name in here and replace world with this dot state dot name. We just have Bob down there, and we're not losing Bob's value. Uh, let me just clean this up a little. Okay. Uh, we're just setting the state every second. So this timer interval, we're setting interval. This is dot tick every one second. Uh, but the problem with doing it this way is that when this component is unmounted, this timer will still be firing. And then it'll lead to errors in your console because you know, this will no longer exist. Or this will be kept in memory, which is even worse. Uh, this instance will never be cleared out of memory and just be clogging the works. So we're setting this instance variable. So we can still set extra values inside of this by using this dot. And then we're setting a timer ID for that's returned from this set interval function. And one key note here I wanted to point out is that uh, you can store uh, fields inside your component that are not necessarily inside a state. So this is because uh, whatever's inside state should be what affects the rendering to the screen. So you see we have, we're using the name and the date inside of state, and we're rendering those values to the screen. So whenever those values change, we want to uh, update the UI. So we put things that, uh, you know, when they change, they'll update the UI. We put those inside a state. Now we have, you know, this timer ID that, you know, does, it's not displayed anywhere. It does not affect anyone uh, with rendering. All it does is it you know, fires this new uh, set state. We can store that in this instance. We just store whatever variable we want. We can create them. You know, you know, in Java, you have to you know, declare your fields inside your instance. But in JavaScript, you can just create them on the fly like this. And you don't have to give them you know, uh, types or anything, at least in ES6. Uh, so we're just assigning this, this value as return from setter interval to this instance variable instance field called timer ID. And the reason we're doing that, like I said, uh, if this component no longer exists, this timer would still be running. So we have to shut down the timer when this component is uh, being deleted. So we do that by hooking into the component will unmount method. We're adding this hook in, and we are going to stop the here we do that right here this clear interval method is another method inside of uh, provided by a react component that we can use we're going to clear it and all we have to do is pass that, that timer id so it knows what to clear doesn't really affect the rendering or anything it's it, this is something that is hard to remember because uh, you don't really see the effects of it until uh, you're running your app for a while and lots of things are changing and then you still see you know, the clock is still ticking in your console here. So you have to be conscious of it. You know, when you set something up, you have to clean it. We don't have to like clean up the state or anything. All those instance variables are fine. It's basically uh, other things you're keeping in memory or other processes that are, are running such as this set interval, which is a perfect example for it. But again, it's going to be hard to see the effects of not using component will on mount until much later in the game. And it's going to be a cryptic problem. So 
being conscious of it from the beginning will save you a lot of headache later. Uh, let's see what else could we got in here. So, so now, so that's all there is about uh, the component life cycle for now. Uh, you can see the sections inside of the state and life cycle uh, documents. It talks about do not modify state directly. Use set state instead, and I'll explain why. State updates may be asynchronous. So this is another uh, another thing we need to to worry about. So when you call set state, you may have to pass pre state and props to this the new state and it explains why here uh, a situation may happen uh, if your state current state depends on the previous state but you see here our current state is completely independent of our previous state we're just creating a new date object if we're going to add one second to the date every time then we would need to use uh, this method here state updates are merged it talks about how you can you know like how I have the date and the name. You could have a post in the comments inside a state, you know, for some kind of form. And uh, you could set the state for posts, and you can set the state for comments in separate methods. And then if you read the last section, you know, this, this just explains how the data flows. So the data flows into props, you know, that goes to the child. And then a child can have its own state, and then a child can choose to pass that state on to the uh, props of another component down, you know, as its child. So this is like the data is coming down the pipe through the components to the children components. Let's talk a little bit about this arrow function. So this set interval method is expecting a function as its first argument and a time in milliseconds for the second argument. In the previous example, you know, we just passed, let's continue control Z this. So we have this. Down here we have this tick function. It's a global function. Uh, it doesn't have it doesn't have this or anything inside of it. It's just a tick function. It just uh, renders the clock every time, every every time it's called. Then we have the set interval, and we pass it the function tick. So this is the same function. We're in JavaScript. We're able to pass functions around, which is cool. Uh, and then we have the time. Now this this looks a lot simpler than what we have over here. It's a lot less punctuation, uh, but they they're doing the same thing. The only difference is that our tick method up here is inside of a class, uh, and it uh, uses this inside of our tick method. So this tick method needs to be aware of what this is. The way JavaScript works. Uh, this the value of this is bound when the function is uh, called. But you can get away or get around that by using arrow functions. So what does that mean exactly? So I'm actually going to dig into this. I think next class. But let's let's start it now. The uh, the arrow function here. So this is shorthand for creating a function. This is very similar to doing something like this. Function, and we can give it, we don't have to give it a name, and we can just give it a body. You see, this still works, sorta, but it's not, it's not updating the time. And that's because the value of this is affected by how you're creating this function. So when you say this.tick, this function is actually uh, this. 
So it's only going out to here when it's saying this and it's saying, oh, this function doesn't have a, a, a tick method inside of it. Which is weird, but that's JavaScript for you. Functions can have functions inside of them. So it's it's looking for this function inside of this function. You can get around that by you know creating a variable called something like that that gets the value of this when the component was mounted, and then it could call that dot tick. And this is the old way of doing it, and it's you know, the way I did it for a long time because it was the only way to do it for. Uh, until ES6 came with the arrow functions. Uh, there's also another way to replace what's bound. <sighs> Excuse me. Uh, that's even more complicated. So you could say, uh, so if you did it this way, uh, you could also get rid of this function wrapper and just pass that dot tick. But it's not working. So that didn't work. I thought it would. So you can't do that. It has to be wrapped in a function. So arrow functions, what they do is they don't they basically this list. They don't replace uh, the this instance with you know the functions this. They just use whatever's in the outer uh, definition of this. So that's nice because uh, I totally messed it up. Oh, yeah, I just need to put parentheses at the end. That's nice because uh, you don't have to re give a value for this. But the arrow functions, you know, they should be used for short lines of, or short methods. Uh, I'm going to show you how you can use arrow functions inside of your uh, class, inside the root level. And I, I can actually show you right here. And I'm going to dig more into this later. But so inside of your class, you could be using arrow functions instead of regular functions. When you do that, you'd say, you know, Instead of having um, the parentheses right after the function name, you would have it, the, the function name equaling the arrow function. So we're passing blank parameters, no parameters, and then we're using the arrow function to create our function, and then we're just passing the function body right after that. You can see this actually seems to be working. I think it's pretty going well. Uh, you can add a, when you do it this way, you should be adding a semicolon after the function, which is different from just having the function uh, and the function body. You don't need the semicolon for that function declaration. What else can I say about error functions? So error functions, uh, the this property, again, that's what is mainly affected by these error functions. But also these error functions are uh, can make your code look a little bit cleaner. So if you look down here, it may look a little confusing, but this is cleaner than doing uh, that function. A question like this. Uh, not only did this, you know, we saw it earlier, it doesn't work, but it uh, it's a lot more wordy than just having parentheses, arrow, and then our function body here. Now, when you have a one-line function body, you don't even need to include the, the uh, curly braces. The curly braces are really only used if you have multiple lines. Do something like that. So you see the curly braces are here, just to make it cleaner. But I could, you know, get rid of these curly braces. Just say that actually looks cleaner than, you know, all this punctuation. 
So we can get rid of this punctuation, these curly braces here. This is only a one-liner. And we don't need a semicolon because this has already a comma delimiter. delimiter. Uh, and it works. We didn't break it. Yay. So this will work with pretty much any of your uh, any of your functions here. So we could say component will unmount equals and then pass it a arrow function. Just get rid of a few lines of code. There's unnecessary lines of code. We can see since this is only a one-liner, uh, replacing it with this. Uh, arrow function just cleans it up a little bit. It's one of those ES6 goodies that came along. Okay. Any questions? I kind of blaze blaze right through that question and answer because uh, I just went into the arrow functions. But if you have any other questions, let me know. Okay. So now let's talk about routing. Everything we've worked on so far, it just has you know one page. But if you wanted to have multiple pages or you know different different sections of your app, then you would be using routing. So how does routing happen? Well, let's talk about URLs first. So the URL is that this section of your browser. This tells you exactly what uh, what site you're on and you know where in that site you are. So the first part of the URL is this HTTP colon slash slash. So that's the protocol. That's the hypertext transport protocol. Uh, the other variant you'll see is HTTPS, and that's the the secure version of the hypertext transport protocol. So it uses encryption to uh, secure the traffic between the, the client and the server. So our browser uses this address to go and pull the resources necessary. It'll pull the uh, whatever specified down to the browser, and then it'll uh, Go through that. It'll generally be like an HTML document, uh, and that HTML document might specify other URLs that need to be pulled down as well. We'll get into that later. For now, just know that this URL provides a link to a basically an external resource, some resource that lives on a server, generally an HTML document that uh, your browser can download and render. So this first section, the www.whatever.com, that's what's known as the host. That's what server the information lives on. So this, the there are all these on the internet. There are what's known as DNS servers that will translate this host into a uh, an actual numeric address, and it will know how to get to that particular server based on that numerical address, and that is has to do with how the internet is built we're not going to dig into that uh, but just know this host specifies the server you're going to now in our examples from webstorm let's see am I, am I running that right now let's run it so you can see uh it is running but i'm not I have it up that's running at localhost 3000 localhost is our current computer this is a special value uh, set up in your computer to uh, to tell it to look just not even bother going to the internet just download the resource from your local computer so you don't you see it doesn't have a dot com or anything it's just uh, just localhost next part we have the port so generally, a server will have 
um, multiple, it may have multiple things running on it. Like it could have an email server running on it, it could have a FTP site, possibly, uh, and it could have a web server on it. So web servers generally run on port 80. And if you see over here, you know, there's no port on codepen.io. That makes it an implied port of port 80. But it's running HTTPS, so actually the implied port for HTTPS, the default port is 443. Uh, but if you're running HTTP, the default port would be 80. So that port is a, a particular, basically like a, a hole in the server where uh, you could access the data through. So if you see all these like hacker movies and talk and when on actual hacking techniques, they talk about scanning ports, scanning open ports on a server, and then basically being able to dig into that port and exploit whatever service is running on the other side in order to gain access to the system. So having more ports open is a security risk for servers. So they only open the ports that are uh, really need to be accessed from the ex ex outside and only run services that they trust. So <laughs> let's get back to it. The the default port when we run our Create React app is port 3000. And that's because you need, uh, in order to run on port 80, you need administrator access. But in order to run in ports above, uh, I forget the exact number, I think it's in the thousands, like 1024 or something, you can, you can run, uh, you can run applications within ports higher than, you know, a certain value. You know, all the other ports below that are reserved for the administrator. So the important thing to note is, uh, you know, when we do create React app, we're running in port 3000, but, you know, that's not because of your project. That's just because how the product's being run. If we deployed your project to uh, another server, it may be running on a different port, maybe even the default port. So you wouldn't need to specify a port. Now that we got all that out of the way, we don't really care about any of this. <clears throat> what we care about in React is just the resource path. And we don't really care about the query string in React. So anything after the question mark is a, a query string parameter. Uh, what React cares about is just this path right here, this relative path. And this determines which component will be rendered to the screen. Uh, But let's look at this uh, page real quick. So in traditional, so yeah, let's talk about this real quick. So you can see here, this is a, uh, it goes over the uh, HTTP protocol. And we're actually gonna be digging more into this next class when we talk about interacting with REST APIs, uh, where that's very heavily URL dependent and that uh, draws pulls data into the uh, system using HTTP. But uh, reading through this is a good read. It's not even React specific. It just has to do with uh, how HTTP works and, and how the URL is specified in HTTP. So if you need a, uh, you, every web developer must know this. So, and it was written in 2013 which is pretty much when React was first starting. Uh, check it out. It's a little difficult. It's a little long. It's pretty cool that they show that on there. That jumps into single page applications versus traditional web applications. So what does this mean? So in traditional web applications, uh, we basically host a bunch of HTML files on a server and each of those HTML files might be like the, the index.html, which is like the home page. And then we would have like about.html, which would have the company information. And then you know, each of these independent files on the system. Uh, then the web server would see a URL come in and it might be slash, you know, whatever domain it is, slash uh, index.html. And a traditional web application will find that index.html file in, in, in the, uh, server and then pass that back to the browser 
And then another, the inside the index HTML, it will have like an about link. Uh, the user clicks on the about link. It makes a request to the server for the about.html. The about.html is, you know, a file on the server. It's pulled and sent over to the client. Uh, and that's the traditional way of doing things. Uh, we'll talk about disadvantages of that in a second. But the in single page applications, it works a little differently. It what it does uh, is all the JavaScript and for all the pages is basically and and the HTML is drawn down and downloaded in the beginning, like when the user first visits the site. Uh, then when there's a link to about.html or about section inside of the you know the home page, when you click on that, the the client will actually run JavaScript to update the page instead of uh, instead of pulling it from the server, pulling all that HTML from the ser server. Uh, if it needs to pull data from the server, it will do just the data it needs in uh, and we'll talk about that in the next class with the REST APIs. But just pulls the data it needs uh, and nothing else. So it's very, the traffic between the client and the server is very light. And this is uh, is very handy for several reasons. So for instance, you can even, uh, the paths are handled in client instead of the paths math being to folders on server. Client requests only data it needs for that path instead of the server sending all HTML for that resource. So it's a lot lighter of a data load. And it can work offline even when changing paths. So technically, if the server doesn't exist, you know, it might have some local data it can work with uh, that makes single page applications pretty neat. But traditional web applications pretty much always require internet connection when you're changing your paths. So uh, if you download the whole application through JavaScript you know, with a single page application, all that, that structure is there, so you don't have to worry about uh, offline access. So React uses single page application architecture as opposed to traditional web applications. Uh, well, sorry, in React, you can use a single page application architecture. You can actually do the traditional way in React as well. Uh, but there is a neat way to do single page applications that makes that works perfectly with React. Uh, React itself does not have routing built in. All it is is the, uh, basically it replaces the HTML ultimately, but you can put React, uh, you can put routing built uh, into your React project by using modules. Right, hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but the key takeaway, is that we're going to be doing single page applications. So the, the path we're going to be getting, it's not going to be hitting the server. It's not going to be an actual physical separate file. It's going to be handled as if it's like a, a separate state inside of your, your uh, React project. We'll go in a, over an example of how that works in a minute. So what we're going to be doing, so to do a single page application, we have to do what's called client side routing. And the client is the web browser. So the web browser is actually handling the paths that we pass into this HTTP uh, URL. So it'll handle all this path right here. It'll be passed as a special variable that we can switch on. So React Router is uh, an NPM module that is the most popular one, I'd say. And it's actually, with React Router version 4, it, it's uh, easier to use than it used to be. So, uh, so it's, it used to be just use React Router for uh, big projects. But uh, and there are ways to still you know, do your own routing. But uh, React Router version 4 is pretty, pretty neat. So I recommend going to here and like watching this intro video. It might be a little bit over your heads. It was over my head a little bit when I was watching it. But there's a lot of good information in here, and it's not that long. It's like nine minutes long. Uh, and then if you go to here, you can see a quick start. Uh, the documentation is pretty neat. It has documentation and then code examples all throughout. 
but this quick start shows you what you need to do. So we need to do yarn add React Router DOM. So first it did the create React app demo app, and then it uh, went into a CD change directory into the demo app. Then it, it ran yarn add React Router DOM. Uh, and don't worry about this next section. It's just if you're using if you're not using yarn, then you could use npm install. But we are using yarn, so we don't need to do that. And then it shows a sample app.js. So you could actually copy and paste all of this into app.js and run it and see how it works and then you know dissect it. Uh, but we're going to be uh, doing a demo of this in a second. So these all right here, you know, these are arrow functions. These are the uh, components. It's creating stateless functional components right in line in the app.js. Uh, and then this is a, a special component that has to do with uh, React Router, this match. You don't have to worry about that yet. We're not going to dig into that yet. And then down here, you can just say we have the links and then we have routes down here. So we're going to dig into this structure down here in a second. Right here. So in this project over here, I ran create React App Starter 3. I, uh, let's, let's kill it. Control C, kill that. Uh, and then I added a couple components in a folder just for the other demo that we'll be using in this demo. Uh, but regardless, I'll show you how those are built, and you can do it yourself. But the key thing we need to do to add the React router is we need to do yarn add React router. Um, we need this DOM at the end that just means document object model. It, uh, React router works in native iOS, native Android code as well. Uh, but with their DOM, we're specifying that we want the router that's meant to work with the uh, with HTML, with our website. So React Router DOM. Not You don't just do React Router. You need the dash DOM at the end. You know There is just a React Router, but that's, uh, that's not what we want. That's the core component. We want the DOM component. So it'll take a couple uh, seconds to a minute, you know, and then I'll show the success. Saved 11 new dependencies, and then we see React Router DOM in here. React Router. So React Router is a dependency to React Router DOM, and now we can use React Router DOM. So we're going to go ahead and import this now. Uh, one convention you should follow with import statements is anything from a module should be at the top, and then anything from relative files should be after that. So let me show you the wrong way first. So import uh, browser router from React Router DOM. The reason I know this import statement is from uh, Let's see, show it. yeah, here, right here. So this is the import you should be using right here. Import browser router as router route link. So in the import statement, you can give your uh, these split out components, these split out uh, things up here, basically inside the curly braces. You can give them new names by using as. So we're giving an alias of router. Uh, if you see, let's see if it's going to explain, complain about this. No, I don't see it yet. Uh, WebStorm's not complaining about it yet, but good practice is to put the import statements from modules before the import statements uh, from relative files, from local files. Okay, so this browser router that we're using as router uh, needs to wrap all of the HTML that um, is affected by the router, by React Router. 
and generally that's going to be your entire app.js. So the way we do that is the JSX element. We just surround our JSX with the router. I'm going to get rid of this header. I forgot to put that in there. So you should be have should be seeing something like this. You see your web storm highlights this in yellow. Element router doesn't have required attribute history. That's fine. Don't worry about that. There's a default history it'll use. Uh, but we could override history. So inside of our app, we have just router, and then we have our child elements, which was our original app.js uh, render method. And we have this component that we imported in the previous section. You know, again, this component looks like this. Uh, it's just exporting a default uh, function that returns the component. And we'll, we'll get into this export uh, business a little bit later. But this is basically showing uh, that a component is being exported from this JS file. So when we go to import it here, that's the component that uh, is passed from this include this import into this variable, this local uh, value here. All right, so we have our router, and we're going to add uh, hello world to this page as well. So you can see how that would look. And we don't have this started yet, so let's start it up. So I'll start up in a second. Here we go. So we have hello world and app.js. But we only want to show the hello world when we go to something like localhost 3000 hello and uh, just that intro text when we're not there. So we're going to add uh, links and routes. So first thing we're going to add are links. So I'm going to go ahead and add a nav section, slash nav. And I'm going to add links. Now, in order to use the link components, we need to import them from React Router DOM as well. So we need to do link in here. So we can import. Uh, we're going to import another thing in a minute, but these uh, two first. And these links kind of work like the a href equals, and you, know, you give it uh, a URL with link. You give it link to, and then you give it a relative path. So I'm going to link to hello. Just like a, uh, a link, the a href, we can pass it. Uh, the text is going to display inside of uh, the child elements. And we're going to link to just a slash needs a home and we can call this one intro we can add like a space and then a bar here just for a key menu here we could style this up we're not going to right now uh, I do have a stylized version I think I have it in here yeah I don't so I'm not gonna do it right now okay I'll show you in the other project if we have time running out. So now we have hello and intro. So if we click on hello, we see the route or the path is changed. Nothing on the page has changed because we haven't defined anything for that uh, particular path yet. We can see we click on hello, hello is added to the path. We click on intro and everything's removed from the path. So let's only display hello world when we get a uh, when we're in the hello path, and we can display app intro when we're inside, you know, the the, the root path. So the way we do that is with we have to use route. So we're going to import that from React Router DOM, and then we're going to use route. This is uh, with route we specify the path, and then we have to specify it's exact, so that it'll only render when it's this exact path. And then we uh, we have to pass it 
the component into here. Unfortunately, we can't use a JSX. Uh, I think there may be a way to pass it as a child element, but uh, this way is straightforward enough. So we're going to do the app intro only when the exact match is slash. So we could save this and we can view it. We're in the intro, click hello, the intro goes away. But now we only want to show hello when we're in the hello sub, uh, it's hello path. So we're going to add another route, path equals slash hello. I'm going to say it's exact. We're going to pass it the component. Okay, there's a couple quotes. And we're just going to pass the hello world component. That way, this hello world will only be mounted when we are out this this route, this this hello path. And let's get rid of this hello world at the end. Save that. Now hello shows when you click hello, and then intro shows up when you click intro. We see this section up here staying the same because this is outside of the routes. So this header is uh, going to be the same for every page. Uh, only these routes are affected by the router. So we have all kinds of routes set up. We can pass all kinds of values. No to worry about that for now. For simple routing, all you need to do is this, and then using these link elements. Uh, and with the simple routing, you know, you could jazz this up a little. Let's see. Let me pull up the other project. So in, in starter two, let's see if I can pull it over. In starter two, I have the same setup, uh, but the only difference is I added some CSS to to style the links, and then um, and the navigation I used UL, which unorder list and list to uh, to create the menu, the link menu, and I just modified those styles. UL and LI you'll see common in uh, in navigation menus, uh, and then it just provides a way of organizing links a little bit more cleanly instead of using uh, a bunch of class names. Uh, so this is a common practice you'll see inside navigation menus seeing list items and unordered lists. When we run this one, uh, it's pretty much the same code. Uh, it just has different CSS for the uh, navigation menu, running it, there it goes. So it just has a slightly fancier navigation menu up here. So again, that app CSS file just looks like this. It has, it adds a border bottom to the uh, nav section. It, inside the nav section, all the unordered list, it turns that into a flex display. Uh, and it justifies content in the center. And then each list item, it gets rid of the bullet, it adds a margin to the right, and increases the font size. And then each link, every A, so link ultimate, ultimately gets converted to an A element in HTML. So with that style, we're, we're getting rid of the text decoration and uh, we're setting the color to orange red. Now this kind of knowledge, knowing that link translates to A instead of you know using something like link, the component name, uh, that kind of stuff is uh, the reason if you read some React advanced React tutorials it, or React guides, it talks about not using CSS at all, like only using um, inline styles in JavaScript. Don't worry about that for now. You know, this uh, the CSS styles using A is perfectly fine. You can figure out what element you want to style by going to uh, your browser, you know, right clicking or context clicking on the element and then doing inspect and we see that's an A element. So we know uh, and we see the CSS being applied here. We can even test it out here, you know, what if we changed all the A elements to green? 
Oh, that's what this would look like now. So, all right, let me know if you have any questions. I'll be on Slack. Uh, and good luck at getting your project done. The Let me know if you have any trouble getting that to run or anything. Uh, hopefully you have it up on GitHub. If you don't, make sure you watch last class where we talk about you know going from Create React app all the way up to GitHub. Uh, and then if you have any problems, you can send me your link to GitHub and I can check it out and give you very tailored advice based on your code. So uh, otherwise, I'll see you all on Wednesday. Right, bye. Thanks for thanks for joining the live or watching it later. <laughs>